Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, my beloved brethren and sistren, to the Tawahado Bible Study Podcast. As always, if you'd like to support, you can support at patreon.com slash Tawahado. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash t-e-w-a-h-i-d-o. A new way you can support is by subscribing to my newsletter. You can subscribe for free or you can pay $5 a month at aksum.substack.com. That's A-K-S-U-M dot substack dot com. Of course, if you don't want to spend anything, you could always just share a copy of the link of wherever you're hearing this, be it Apple, Google, Transistor, YouTube, or anywhere else. And make sure, above all, that you let the words of God sink into you and you share them. Last week, I just did an interview on justification, but this week we're back to the scroll. And this scroll is the scroll of Jude. Now, I did this scroll sometime in 2016 or 17, and I remember without realizing it, it ended up being like an hour episode. And, you know, that, that justification conversation really was long, but that's not the typical episode that I like to give out. In the Ethiopian culture, we have something called the gursha, which is a biteful or a handful of food, and it makes things very easy to digest, and it's a way where people can remember how to you know give each other the word when it's when it's a bit shorter and easier to to remember and that's the same thing with the gursha it's it's easy to give somebody a mouthful or a handful or a biteful but if you stuff too much in their mouth they'll be biting off more than they can chew as the american aphorism goes so anyway i plan to do just verses 1 to 13 of jude today and you'll see just even this is really a, a tremendous project because Jude assaults you with so many references to the Hebrew Bible and indeed the Septuagint that you you have to have a wide view of scripture, a very open-minded view of scripture, and you have to dive deep in order to even understand this message and you have to repeatedly listen to it. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to do verses 1 to 13 this week. And, you know, we'll get to Revelation. I know I told you we'll get to Revelation, and by now I should have. But, you know, I'm delaying it. I, I always delay it because I always feel I need to study a little bit more before I, I dare to teach on St. John's Revelation. In any event, I think I'll do at least three different weeks in addition in between Jude verses 1 to 13 and the rest of the chapter, which goes to about verse 25 that explains some of the background which is being quoted in Jude because of how epic Jude is. And and again, I'm, I'm not even going to have to delve into the Deuterocanon, but just the mainstream, wholly accepted Hebrew Bible references themselves are, are bountiful. They're plentiful. Without further ado, verses 1 to 2. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Jude, for those of you hearing this in this nice revised standard version English translation, is to be reminded in all the ears of all the hearers that Jude is actually Judah. So realize Jude is Judah. Remember, Judah is one of the kingdoms. The other kingdom is Israel. Remember, the brother of James is also the brother of the Lord. But James, as we went through his epistle and the five chapters, is also Jacob. And Jacob is also renamed Israel. So Israel and Judah make up all of the people who are that random sample population chosen by God. So with Judah and with Israel or Jacob or James included in the New Testament, you have all the Jews being reached out to and you have all the Israelites being reached out to because Jews are Judahites and you have all the Gentiles reached out to. 
Everyone is given a message. Everyone is called, as it says here. Many are called, but few are chosen. If you're hearing this not right now, you are called, especially if you're of a Judahite or Israelite background. We have these three ideas here, the mercy, the peace, and the love. Love is something worked out. Love is something acted upon. It's not just a lovey-dovey idea that rests in your thoughts. Peace is what you leave one another with, whether you're on the same page about love or not. And mercy is what we hope and we pray for on the judgment day that is spoken of in very terrifying and awful terms throughout this chapter. Verses 3 to 4. Beloved, being very eager to write to you of our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For admission has been secretly gained by some who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly persons who pervert the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Pay attention to the words of Judah here. There is a common salvation, not an individual salvation, but a common, a communal, a communitarian, a societal salvation. We need to rid ourselves of the rugged American individualism that is an ideal of our context, or at least my context. I don't know if you're outside of America and listening to me because you're also an English speaker. But in our context, we need to rid ourselves of this idea of individual salvation. The biblical text is telling us our salvation is common, and we need to contend for that common salvation, for that common faith, which is once and for all delivered to the holy ones or to the saints, those who are sanctified by the precious blood of Christ. There is no new teaching under the sun. The teaching is one and the same. It's the teaching from the beginning, as we learned in the Johnine literature. What we need are new examples for each ever-evolving context. We do not reinvent the wheel. The wheel is the apostolic teaching, an heirloom, a deposit, a trust given to the apostles by the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is once and for all given to us. But each of us have our own contexts. We have rural contexts, we have urban contexts, we have various ethnic contexts. All of it comes and we bring it to be submitted to the one gospel of Jesus Christ in which there can be no licentiousness. There is a literal licentiousness and a functional licentiousness. Literal licentiousness is having sex with multiple partners. That is not permitted in the one gospel. The functional licentiousness is by cheating on God with other gods. And that is any form of disobedience to God can be referred to as licentiousness. It is the teaching of all the prophets, but you can especially find it in the scroll of the 12 with Hosea and in the scroll of Ezekiel. Verses 5 to 7. Now I desire to remind you, though you were once for all fully informed, that he who saved a people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels that did not keep their own position, but left their proper dwelling, have been kept by him in eternal chains in the nether gloom until the judgment of the great day, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise acted immorally and indulged in unnatural lust, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Again, as I mentioned at the top, we have three examples from the canon and from the Deutero canon because Judah makes no such distinction. There is no canon in the time frame of the original hearers of Judah. Canons, especially New Testament canons, don't come until centuries later. And so what we are dealing with 
is a person who is drawing upon the common literature of the day to instruct the Judahites that were trusting in Jesus, at least with their lips. And he's hoping to convince them through this instruction to trust in their hearts as well, to have circumcised lips and circumcised hearts, which is the teaching of Exodus, the teaching of Deuteronomy, the teaching of Jeremiah. And we have here an example of Joshua and Caleb, although they're not named explicitly, they are the only ones who are not destroyed. Remember, even Moses does not really believe, does not really trust God. And when he is told to use a certain technique to get water from a rock, rather than trusting in how God is telling him in the moment, he trusts on what he's seen God do in the past. In any event, what he's doing is he's disobeying God in the moment. And so there's no way that you could even use past commands of God if he's giving you new commands. Moses doesn't see the promised land. You hear MLK talking about it in his, one of his most famous speeches, that he may not get to the promised land, but he sees the coming of the glory of the Lord. Moses was able to, for his efforts of past faith, look at the promised land, but not enter it. Instead, he dies outside. Only Joshua and Caleb make it. If you want to know how they make it, you're going to have to go and reread Exodus. The second example that's given is the example of fallen angels. This excites some people. This terrifies other people. What we know is Judah is relying upon the fallen angels, some who identify them as the Nephilim, as people who are being judged by God and that the people in his day who are false teachers, who are men from the Judahite community, are also participating in actions like the ones who were destroyed besides Joshua or Caleb, like the fallen angels. And the third example, like all of the unrighteous people of Sodom and Gomorrah, remember Abraham does this negotiation tactic from 50 to 40 down to 10 and can't even find 10 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah. And so the false teachers of the Judahites are like the Sodomites and the Gomorrahites are like the fallen angels, are like everybody who was in the wilderness except for Joshua and Caleb. That's scary. Verses 8 to 13. Yet in like manner, these men in their dreamings defile the flesh, reject authority, and revile the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, disputed about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a reviling judgment upon him, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these men revile whatever they do not understand, and by those things that they know by instinct as irrational animals do, they are destroyed. Woe to them, for they walk in the way of Cain and abandon themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perish in Korah's rebellion. These are blemishes on your love feasts as they boldly carouse together, looking after themselves, waterless clouds, carried along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the nether gloom of darkness has been reserved forever. So that's enough of the living word of God today. We'll get into the rest of the Jude eventually. But just here, we have the men of Judah, these Judahites who are false teachers, are likened to three biblical examples and then seven mashals or parables, this kind of waxing poetic or poetic verbiage that is used to explain that these Judahites or false teachers have no actions accompanying their alleged faith in Christ Jesus. They reject the apostolic authority. We've seen that in the diaspora where certain parishioners will create boards and they will reflect the Protestant model. And I've seen them in my own life 
make homeless and kick out of their, their church the patriarch and two different bishops in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. This kind of rejection of authority is nothing new. It's the same thing that these Judahites are dealing with. To understand the kind of importance of authority, you have Cain, you have Balaam, and you have Korah given as examples. To understand Cain, you have to reread Genesis chapter 4. To understand Balaam, you have to reread Numbers chapter 22. To understand Korah, you have to reread Numbers chapter 16. So that we can digest this teaching in greater fullness, what I'll do is I'll spend the next few weeks going over Genesis 4, Numbers 22, and Numbers 16. So we could understand this, but simply put, Cain, Balaam, and Korah, and the Judahites who are false teachers, who are all of these things, they're clouds, they're uprooted, they're twice dead, all of these things, what they're doing, what their sin is, is rejection of apostolic authority. And so we have to make sure that we keep from that and that we are obedient to it because it is through Jesus whom we have access to eternal life and it is from him that that authority springs forth from glory to god for all things